Aisha, would you like to carry on? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Clea. As you just heard, Clea just mentioned several forms of gender-based violence. And I think I'll start by saying I've never been in an emergency where there was only one form of gender-based violence, where there was only sexual violence, where there was only rape. Um, and I have not ever studied or heard of an emergency where, where that has happened either. So why is that important? I mean, a, a huge part of why that's important is that we understand how to respond to the multiple forms of violence that women and girls face. And I, I say women and girls as they are really the largest group affected by gender-based violence around the world. But how survivors face violence, um, it helps inform how we mitigate violence and the risk and the multiple risks that, that Clay just mentioned, among many others. And that's across sectors, how many different sectors that respond within emergencies know how to mitigate those risks and work to preventing them. So you mentioned um, IPV, in, intimate partner violence, and I think that's, that's one of the critical ones that we, um, as a humanitarian agent, uh, community, need to talk much more about, understand more about, and be able to respond to. In, uh, in West Africa, we looked at our service-based information, our services over the last 10 years, and in countries of uh, Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, or uh, Ivory Coast, and, and Sierra Leone, um, we basically saw that six out of 10 women walking through our doors were coming in because of domestic violence, because of intimate partner violence. And that's, that's massive, 63% of women coming through our doors. And I think one of the issues around IPV has been that, you know, the humanitarian community has said that that's really a, uh, a development issue. The development community has said that that is a private issue. It's, it's nobody's issue. And in fact, if six out of 10 women or 63% or of women walking through a service provider's doors in a humanitarian context is because of IPV, then in fact, IPV is a humanitarian issue. So that is one of the ways that we can really look at how to understand the multiple forms of violence that are happening. Again, really critically for, for responding, first and foremost, mitigating those risks and, and working on preventing them. And I think part of that answer is also through how we have the specific technical standalone GBV programs that provide that really critical expertise in which to, to do that, to work with survivors, to work with proper services, to work with communities on very difficult, sensitive issues, and how, and, and how we have mainstreaming, how we have GBV mainstreaming throughout sectors and emergency, because this is in fact everybody's, it is everybody's responsibility. So somehow along the way, things change to a GBV standalone programming versus mainstreaming. And I don't know where that shift happened, because in fact, it really requires an and. We need both to really address the enormous needs in an emergency that, and, and, and the needs of gender-based violence. Thanks very much, Aisha. Some really uh, important points from both of you. Um, Cleo, I, I know also, I'm taking advantage of you now, because I know where you've been. I know you've recently been to, to Kenya again. To, to look at different support to violence against women and girls programming there. And I, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that context and maybe share some of the emerging findings. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I just should jump in and say I'm not. I wasn't. I wasn't advocating mainstreaming or integrated programming at the expense of specialized programming. I think the specialized, which you know, um, I think the specialized programming is 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 crucial, and we we really do think it's um, it's very important that both are supported. Um, I think it's it's sometimes hard to to get the specialized programming started from the first phase of an emergency. Um, and we are losing, we do tend to lose some of the focus on the on the integration and the mainstreaming of, of that kind of um, support. Um, I, the Kenya the Kenya example is kind of an interesting to to juxtapose with the um, with the Philippines. Um, and it's the the reason for my visit was um, was because DFID has made this commitment to look at all of its humanitarian programming and to and within all of our humanitarian support to ensure that we are assessing violence against women and girls and looking at it, um, looking at whether our programming is adequately addressing the issue um, and that we're providing, you know, where as, as good a response as we possibly can um, or that there is a response being provided. Um, and so this was sort of part of that, of that looking at some of our, our programming. So it wasn't looking at new programming as we were in the Philippines where we were sort of putting in place new, um, new programs. We were looking at our existing programming. 
Um, and, and the support that we're providing is largely for, for refugees, our humanitarian support in Kenya is largely um, looking at refugees. Um, but it, there are a series of very different contexts. So you have Dadaab, which is, of course, a massive, um, a massive camp. Some of it is uh, quite old, so you have sort of a protected refugee uh, situation um, with some very old problems and a lot of the, the problems that you encounter in a, in a longer-term camp setting. Um, but there's also areas where there are new arrivals. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, where there are new arrivals, um, it's also a bit of a challenge in that the security situation in Dadaab is uh, quite difficult. So the capacity of protection actors and anyone, in fact, to be in the camps, um, certainly without any kind of protection or, or security presence, is quite limited. So um, it, it's a very different kind of approach to Kakuma, which was, <coughs> which is the other refugee context, which is also. A highly protracted context in some ways, but also receiving new arrivals, largely South Sudanese refugees, um, and receiving new arrivals every day, you know, based on the situation right now in South Sudan. So, um, and then in the middle of that, you have a huge urban refugee population uh, in Nairobi, which has its own issues. And so, there's there's quite a you know within a relatively what is I think a relatively limited humanitarian program for us. It's there's quite a range of issues, and um, and I think looking at, at, at how we respond to all of those, um, you know, do, does the programming that we're supporting um, respond to all of the different needs is, is a massive challenge, and I think it's not up to, you know, one donor or one organization to meet those needs, but to, to try to work together to make sure that, that between us we're, we're covering as much as possible. Um, what's interesting, um, I think there are both challenges and opportunities with protracted contexts. Um, I looked quite a bit at the at the situation in in Dadaab, um, and it's. I think there there are, yeah the challenges. Um, I think are are there are a few. One is um, the funding tends to dry up after a while. Um, it's a massively expensive refugee operation, um, and with all of the other crises that are going on, and with all of the limitations on funding, there just isn't the same amount of funding available for. Um, for that camp that as, as there might have been at one time. And I think one of the things that we heard was that that puts a lot of constraints on the kind of programming that we're able to do in those contexts. So, um, and, and there's a real risk with that in the sense that, you know, you, you have your, your response to violence um, against women and girls, which might include medical, medical care for survivors of sexual violence, um, among other kind of responses. Um, but a lot of the sort of more preventive, the more um, experimental or um, innovative uh, prevention programming, which might include, I mean, there, there's education and there's a big focus on education and trying to keep girls in school, but things about kind of trying to generate, um, generate opportunities for empowering women, giving them more, um, more access to opportunities, um, those tend to be the first programs that get cut. And, and I think because protection is, and it's one of the things that you referred to, Wendy, earlier, um, because one of the, the big challenges is showing impact um, of both prevention um, and, and I think protection programming in general, you have things that are very measurable, like the amount of food that is in the food rush and the amount of water that is provided. Um, and you can see immediately when those fall below acceptable standards. It's not as obvious when you fall below acceptable standards in terms of protection programming. What is an acceptable standard? Where do you put that? Um, and so that tends to be one of the first things that gets nibbled away at. Um, and so that's, that's, that's quite a, a challenge. Um, the other challenge to a protracted setting is that it's um, people tend to get into a rhythm of doing the same kind of, they put programs in place, those programs start running, and they continue to do the same kind of programs um, and don't necessarily shake it up, look at it with fresh eyes. You have um, people that have been there for a long time, and they, and, and it, it's very easy to get into doing the same kind of programming. So, um, so that's something that needs to kind of constantly be refreshed. Um, the opportunity <coughs> is that things like, I think, I think there's not, I mean, when we talk about things like IPV or intimate partner violence, um, I think in a lot of emergency situations, we don't deal with, humanitarian organizations don't deal with them, not because they're not interested or concerned, um, and it's the same thing with a lot of more sensitive or difficult issues to tackle, it's because they don't know how to tackle them, particularly when they're new to the context, 
Um, there's a lot of emergency people coming in who don't necessarily know the country very well that they're working in. They don't know the cultural mores. They don't know how to address it or how to get into the issue. <coughs> and I think one of the advantages to a protracted situation is that you do have <laughs> the advantages. Um, if, if that can be said to be an, an advantage, um, is that you do have the time to start looking at more of these issues and engaging more. And I think there has been some interesting work that's, that's been happening in some of the camps around, um, around really pushing for, for more education um, for, for girls, around um, giving more opportunities to women, um, around kind of addressing some of the uh, issues to a greater or lesser extent, um, the FGM, or the female genital mutilation or cutting, um, I think they've been tackling for years um, and haven't made a lot of progress, but it is something that there's more space to do because because of the protracted nature of the situation. Um, and there have been some, some real advances in terms of, um, you know, girls having more opportunities in the camps. And I think um, I've seen other studies where we talk about um, displacement actually sometimes providing opportunities to women that they might not have had otherwise. Um, and I know everybody else needs to talk as well, so I will, I will um, <laughs> stop there. Um, but just to, yeah, I think, um, I think the main, I think the main message, sort of looking both at the Philippines and at and at the Kenya um, experiences, um, we're trying to kind of situate uh, our our response within DFID um, to violence against women and girls within a broader protection framework. So we're really looking at um, at the whole protective environment and at all of the risks. And and I think, you know, what what we're trying to encourage all of our humanitarian advisors and our field staff to do is to really to really do a good assessment of what the what the risks are, and to to be aware of a, a very wide, a very broad range of risks um, and vulnerabilities, um, and then look at how those can be addressed. Thanks, Clea. Um, I'm, I'm, I wanted I was going to ask a question about the um, about evidence, which I will do, but I'll come back to later. I first wanted to go back to Aisha. And Aisha, I wanted to ask you in in your article, you note how data on the prevalence of incidents of gender-based violence is not a good indicator of whether gender-based violence services are needed. And I wonder if you could um, explain to us why that's the case. Sure, thank you very much. I mean, part of what we've come together today to discuss is, is gender-based violence and emergencies and the fact that we have ample, ample evidence from multiple countries and multiple contexts that show that gender-based vi violence occurs in emergencies and therefore We've come today to talk about how to act, right? How to promote those services and the, and the fact that we have these international standards that compel us to provide services no matter what. On the other hand, we can talk about prevalence in terms of an example. I spent a lot of time in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Here's a country where we have had prevalence studies, more than one. That information still wasn't enough to compel or inform our actions in 2012 and 2013, so that in 2012, gender-based violence was 1%, le less than 1% of the humanitarian pooled funding of, of the resp emergency response in, in Eastern DRC. In late 2012, 2013, um, I think a really strong example is that we were responding to after the capital city of Goma was taken over in North Kivu by rebels, large, large humanitarian response required and once again, in these, in these coordination meetings that I was a part of, uh, different sectors, different multi-sectoral assessments were saying, we haven't heard any GBV reports, and it wasn't prioritized. Uh, we have emergency response teams, local teams that are, are raring to go, and so they deployed as fast as possible and set up services and camps in the displacement camps in North Kivu. Survivors came forward to disclose their violence and to receive help the same day those services went up, in every camp, every time. An example of around, again, our impetus, our, 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 the onus is on us to act, to provide those services, and then see how we can use other information to better inform our programming going forward. Um, and actually, DFID was one of the first to really fund our emergency response teams in that 2013 crisis. Uh, again, that incredible this call to action and putting these resources behind really saying we do need to provide, provide these services from the onset of a crisis. We had those services up and running in, in the first week, the first two weeks, and, and they kept expanding from there. 
I think another just maybe important example is just to say um, that working with local organizations helps talk, talk to some of the, some of the important issues that, that Clay was bringing up around saying that cultural information, that cultural knowledge uh, is critical and that really has helped us expand our reach in a country as large and as complicated as DRC, have the cultural competency, um, and really be prepared to respond. So our teams were already informed, already trained, in place, ready to respond when that crisis broke out. Do you think that, the, that most donors now and the, I, I suppose, responders to GBV are beginning to understand uh, that that service-based approach can give them the information that they need is better than demanding prevalence data? Or do you think some prevalence data is, is still necessary but doesn't need to be collected before you, know, you actually begin to respond? Service-based data is not the only form of data and it really needs to be studied within its context, analyzed within a context, and whenever possible triangulated with contextual analysis, uh, perhaps other surveys or other forms of qualitative data collection. Um, we, we, we hope, I think DFID is an example of a donor that's saying we do not require that prevalence data to act. Uh, and we hope that other donors, and we believe that call to action is requiring other donors to heed that call. That is critical. What we're hoping also, and what we're shouting from the rooftops is that it's an incredible, I think, uh, benefit that you provide these services Women can access the services they need, life-saving services. And, I mean, it's important to note, I think that this is not about data collection. This is about providing the best services possible. When survivors come through the doors, they're posed questions around the, the way a service provider can best really provide the best medical care or counseling or perhaps a referral that may be necessary for a survivor. And those questions that are, that are asked and posed of a survivor turn into service-based data. And that data can really provide a critical window into what is happening in a certain area, what should be funded, and how we can best respond to survivors' needs and work with the community and work with men and boys to really address that violence. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to move next to Alina, and I know that Aurelie and Sarah have been very quiet over here, but I'm shortly moving on to them as well, so they won't escape my, uh, my questions. 